molecules. We're going to focus on organic chemistry, and this is the really exciting stuff. This is the part that um, has a lot of application for the human body. The four categories of biomolecules we're going to focus on are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So when we look at these biomolecules, they're going to be polymers in our bodies, generally speaking. These macromolecules are really large and they have incredibly high molecular weights in our bodies. They are made of, we categorize them as a polymer, poly meaning many, mer for subunit, there's many subunits going together to make these macromolecules. The subunits are called monomers, a one subunit piece is a monomer. Starch is a classic polymer in our bodies, and we get it from food that we eat. And when we look at a typical starch molecule, or amylose molecule, it has 3,000 monomers joined together. This process of making a polymer, of joining the monomers together, is called polymerization. And when we polymerize something, we make a large molecule. Now, as we are looking at these monomers or polymers, we need to be able to break the polymers apart. This process of breaking a polymer apart is called hydrolysis or hydrolysis. It's the addition of water for hydro to lyse to just break apart a chemical bond. So here's a dimer, a classic, you know, in between between a polymer and a monomer. We have a dimer, a two subunit molecule, and this two subunit molecule can have a water molecule added right here to where there's a covalent bond to an oxygen and another covalent bond and it breaks it apart by adding two hy a hydrogen and a hydroxide or a H2O we have broke we have destroyed that covalent bond we have hydrolyzed that dimer into two separate monomers the opposite of hydrolysis is dehydration synthesis. And when we think of synthesis, I want you to think of making something larger. To dehydrate is to remove water. And this process of removing water, think of D and hydrate for water, removing water to make a bigger molecule. That is dehydration synthesis. It's the opposite of hydrolysis. So if we take the hydrogen from one molecule, the OH from another molecule, we can cleave them off, make water, and form a dimer. Physiologically speaking, we make water as a byproduct during this process, and we use this water in our bodies. This is how we get some of our dietary water that we need to stay alive. Let's move on to the first category of organic molecules, carbohydrates. When we look at our carbohydrates, think of these as sugars. We have complex sugars or simple sugars. And these carbohydrates are hydrophilic molecules. They can be easily dissolved in water. And what do we use these carbohydrates for in our bodies? We use these carbohydrates in our bodies as a source of energy. We use these as fuel for our bodies. Think of these as short-term fuel. All carbohydrates, whether it's a complex carb or a simple carb, will eventually get broken down and turned into glucose. And then we take that glucose and we burn it, so to speak. We oxidize it to make ATP, or, or the energy currency of the cell. We'll talk more about ATP at the end of this presentation. As we're looking at carbohydrates, there are some root words that we can use to, to help recognize that we're looking at a sugar. If you ever see saccar as a root word, um, or sacride, sac, or sac as a root word. That's a key root word for all or for many sugar molecules. A suffix at the end of the word ose, ose, is another key word that you or phrase that you can look at to recognize it as being a sugar molecule. So think of glucose, fructose, galactose. Those are all sugars here that have the ose. At the end, these are these glucose, fructose, and galactose are monosaccharides in that they are one sugar molecules. Something that's interesting about these one sugar molecules is that they all have the exact same chemical formula. They are all isomers of each other. So if we look at glucose, galactose, and fructose, they're all monosaccharides. They are one subunit sugars, and we are going to use them as energy sources in our bodies. Glucose is that preferred blood sugar. That's the one that we use for energy more than any other sugar in our bodies. We also have two subunit sugars. These are called 
disaccharides. They're made of two monosaccharides bound together. Classic monosaccharides in the human being include sucrose, lactose, and maltose. And these monosaccharides are shown to the right of the screen. We have our sucrose, our lactose, and our maltose. When we consume these monosac or these disaccharides, we break them down into the monosaccharides that they're made of. Notice the color coordinating scheme. We have green for glucose, yellow for galactose, brown for fructose, and then we use those monosaccharides to make the disaccharides. Glucose is the most common of the monosaccharides. It's used to make up the majority of these disaccharides on our screen. We also have polysaccharides made of many sugar monosaccharides or many subunits. We need to have at least three. Excuse me, we need to have at least 50 subunits. The three most common polysaccharides are going to be glycogen. You can think of glycogen as a complex carbohydrate that's made by animals. So glycogen is the complex carb made by animals. In human beings, most of our glycogen is going to be in our liver or our muscular tissue, particularly the skeletal muscle tissue. But we also store some glycogen within our brain, the uterus, and the vagina itself. Another complex carbohydrate or polysaccharide is starch. This is the complex carb of plants. So glycogen is the complex carb that's made by animals. Starch is the energy storage carbohydrate of plants. We as humans eat starches and we use those glucoses present in the starch to give us energy. Another complex carbohydrate made by plants is cellulose. Cellulose is the cell wall or the rigid structural material from a plant, and it's not digestible by human beings. So we don't use it as an energy source. However, it's really important for us to eat cellulose because it gives us fiber. It helps to aid us with the process of moving feces through the colon by giving us that dietary fiber we need. Up next we have lipids, and the thing I really want to emphasize for you with lipids is that lipids are hydrophobic. Lipids do not mix with water. All the other biomolecules that we're going to talk about in this presentation, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and proteins, can mix with water. Lipids are the only ones that never mix with water, ever. Lipids are hydrophobic, water-fearing. And when we look at lipids, lipids are energy-wise very dense. We have a lot of calories per gram. Um, when we look at nutritional information, lipids have 9 calories per gram, whereas proteins and carbs are going to have 4 calories per gram. The three most significant lipids that we're going to talk about are the triglycerides, the phospholipids, and the steroids. There are other lipids out there, um, such as fatty acids or the echinocids, but we're not going to focus on those ones right now. We're going to focus on the big three. So when we look at triglyceride, that's going to be what we traditionally just call fat. A triglyceride is three fatty acids bound to one glycerol. So it's a tri for three fatty acids, glyceride for the glycerol molecule that's being used. As we look at a triglyceride, a key characteristic of a triglyceride is that if it's solid, we call it fat, and if it's a liquid, we call it an oil. Our solid triglycerides are from saturated fatty acids, and then our Oils, the ones that are liquids at room temperature, will be polyunsaturated fatty acids. And we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about saturated versus unsaturated fats. This is not a human nutrition class. Just know that saturated fats are solids, unsaturated fats are oils. When we look at these triglycerides, we use these for energy storage. And I want you to think of long-term energy storage. We can store energy in many different ways in the human body. We can store it as ATP, we can store it as glycogen, or we can store it as fat. And when we store energy as fat, um, that's the long-term energy store. Anyone who's ever tried to lose a little bit of body weight could tell you that getting rid of that stubborn belly fat is, well, it's a pain in the butt. It's hard to use the energy that's in this long-term energy storage. We also use triglycerides to insulate our bodies and to also serve as shock absorption. When we look at fatty acids, if they are unsaturated fatty acids, we'll have a double bond. So the key thing to look for for an unsaturated fat is that it has a double bond. Oop, I need to go back here. And when we look at this double bond within the fats, there's different ways we can organize the molecule around the double bond. If we have 
the carbons on opposite sides of the double bond. We call that a trans fat. And these trans fats don't naturally occur in nature. Um, all trans fats come from artificial processes. We don't make them in our bodies. And these trans fats, chemically speaking, are more stable than cis fats. Because they're more stable, they're harder to remove from our bodies, and they are a, a contributor to heart disease, and they tend to build up in our bodies. Cis fats, on the other hand, are going to have the kink in them. And around that double bond, we'll have the carbons on the same side of the double bond. By putting the carbons on the same side of the double bond, that causes there to be more of a bend in the molecule. And I'll emphasize this again with the trans fats. Carbons are on the opposite sides of the double bond. With cis fats, the carbons are on the same side of the double bond. Cis fats do occur naturally in nature. We do make them in our body, and ge that is why cis fats, generally speaking, are the preferred fat for a dietary source. They don't have as many negative side effects. Another common fat in our body is the phospholipid. When we look at phospholipids, these are similar to triglycerides, except that instead of having three fatty acids, we have two, and that third fatty acid is going to be replaced with a phosphate group. And that phosphate group is a highly polarized region that likes to be exposed to water. This is a highly charged, highly polar head on the fatty acid, but the or on the the phospholipid, but down here with the fatty acid tails, these are non-polar fatty acid tails that do not like being mixed with water. So what we have with a phospholipid is this perfect combination of a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head because it, we have a water-loving and a water-fearing reg water region on the same molecule. Because it's both hydrophobic and hydrophilic, we call it amphipathic. And this amphipathic property of the phospholipid is what allows for it to make something in our body that's very important, the cell membrane. We use phospholipids to make membranes in our bodies. This is the foundation of the membrane of the cell. We also have steroids. When we think of a steroid, I want you to look at this cholesterol molecule that I have over here on the side of the screen, the basic steroid molecule. We have two or excuse me, three six carbon rings and one five carbon ring all linked together. What do we use steroids for? We use steroids, generally speaking, to serve as a signaling molecule in the cell. Think of the estrogens, the progesterone, the testosterone. We can make a lot of steroid-based hormones in the human body. We also are going to use steroids to make the cell membrane more rigid. Though as we increase the amount of cholesterol present in the cell membrane, the membrane around the cell becomes more viscous or more um, rigid. And if we remove cholesterol from the cell membrane, the cell membrane becomes less viscous and less rigid. So we, we can change how flexible the membrane of the cell is by changing the concentration of cholesterol in our bodies. Um, I, I've just got to share this. This is really cool. So one of the things that was done is we um, researchers have looked at human beings that live in cold climates and human beings that live in warm climates. And it's been found that human beings that live in cold climates, one of the minor adaptations that they have, or one of the ways they acclimate to that colder climate, is they have less cholesterol present in their cell membranes compared to human beings that live in warmer climates. Human beings that live in warmer climates will have more cholesterol present in their cell membranes, making their membranes just a little bit thicker, rigid, and more viscous to help compensate for those warmer temperatures that they are exposed to. All right, let's move on to proteins. I love proteins. Proteins are what get me really excited. Um, there is so much diversity within proteins, and proteins are the single most common biomolecule in the human being. Um, if we were to remove all of the water from the human being, most of what's left over, over half of what's left over, would be protein by mass. When we look at a protein, it's a polymer. It's a, many subunits of amino acids linked together. Amino acids are the subunit of a protein. I have two amino acids shown on the right over here. Note, as we look at these amino acids, they have part of the amino acids are the same, but highlighted in pink, there's differences of our, in our amino acids. 
in human beings, we have 20 different amino acids that are used to make up all of the proteins of our bodies. You could think of this as 20 different kinds of Lego bricks that we can mix and match to make the different proteins of our bodies. This region that's highlighted in pink, we refer to as the R group of the amino acids. And this R group is what gives the different amino acids the different chemical properties that they have. As we are linking amino acids together to make a protein molecule, the shape of that protein is really important. We call the unique three-dimensional shape, or the, the specific shape of the protein, its conformation. And conformation is going, what its conformation is typically going to be the correct shape. Um, as we have proteins in our bodies, sometimes they oscillate around and they change shapes temporarily, but ultimately, when they have the correct shape, when they have the correct conformation, that protein will do the correct job. Let's think back to the big theme of anatomy and physiology. Structure determines function. The shape of the protein determines the function of the protein. So if we change the shape, if we denature the protein, we make it so that the protein no longer functions. Classic ways to denature proteins include extreme heat or having extreme fluctuations within pH. So here's an egg being cooked. The albumin is a protein present of the white of the egg, and as we heat up that albumin, it goes from colorless and dissolved in water to white, opaque, and no longer capable of being dissolved in water. By heating up the albumin, we denatured it and changed its shape. As proteins are being formed, there's four levels of organization. Um, the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary levels. And we'll talk about each of those briefly. The primary structure of a protein is just the order of amino acids within that protein. So the think of them as the beads on a string. So as we look at these individual amino acids, they are just linked together to form the limp spaghetti noodle, the beads on a string. And these amino acids, as they're ordered and arranged on the protein, are going to give it a specific structure. As those amino acids interact with each other, they can form spirals or they can zigzag back and forth. And those spirals and zigzags are called the secondary structure. Spirals or are helices are called the alpha helix. Here is an alpha helix on the screen for you. And then the zigzags are called the beta pleated sheets. And you can take multiple spirals and multiple zigzags from the same string of amino acids and fold them back and forth on each other. As we take the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets and combine them with each other, that gives us the tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure is where a lot of proteins are going to stop. Every once in a while, multiple chains of polypeptides, multiple tertiary structures combine to form a quaternary structure. Quaternary structures aren't very common. They are only going to occur in some proteins, and we have to have multiple polypeptide chains combined together to make a quaternary structure. The classic example of a quaternary structure is a hemoglobin molecule, which is made of four polypeptide chains being linked together, two alpha subunits and two beta subunits being linked together. When we look at proteins, they have a lot of functions in the human body. They give us structure. Um, think of keratin and collagen. These are two structural proteins that are very common within the human being. We also use proteins for communication. Communicating with proteins is probably going to be done at a hormonal level. we got to have hormone-based proteins in addition to steroid-based proteins. We also can use proteins to communicate by ha labeling the surface of the cell and they, when cells come in physical contact with each other, they can communicate with each other based on those proteins on their surface. We can use proteins for membrane transport to allow molecules to go into and out of the cell and we can also use proteins as catalysts. A protein-based catalyst is called an enzyme. Enzymes are proteins that speed up chemical reactions. We can use proteins to recognize and protect our bodies. Lots of the immune system depends on the shape of proteins. The antibodies in our immune system are all protein molecules and we use proteins to label cells that belong in our body and recognize cells that don't belong in our bodies. We can use proteins for movement. In particular, dynin is a motor protein that we use to change or move things around within the cell, within the cytoskeleton of the cell. We use motor proteins to change shapes of cells in our bodies. And then finally we can use proteins for cell adhesion. Some proteins will 
bind cells together. Um, a classic example of that would be laminin. Laminin is a protein that looks a little bit like a cross or a crosslink that holds cells together. We can bind cells together with proteins and keep tissues from falling apart. We also have nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are going to be the last biomolecule that we talk about. And when we think of a nucleic acid, it's a polymer made of nucleotides. So this nucleotide is the monomer. A nucleic acid is a polymer, and that's kind of a common sticking point. The two most common nucleic acids are deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and ribonucleic acid, RNA. DNA is and RNA are have a lot of similarities and a lot of differences to, to each other. Um, so let's talk about some of the similarities and differences. They're both made of nucleotides. Um, DNA is going to be double-stranded and a section of DNA will be make a gene. A, you can think of a gene as the blueprint or instructions that we need to make a protein molecule. When we look at RNA, there are three kinds of RNA we're going to focus on in this class. Messenger RNA, known as mRNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. So messenger RNA is going to be mRNA, then we have ribosomal or rRNA, and then finally transfer or tRNA. And these RNA molecules can be really small at 70 subunits or really large at 10,000 subunits. Some of these kinds of RNA we use to carry genetic information. That's the messenger RNA. Others we use to make ribosomes. That's the well, ribosomal RNA, RNA. And others we use to transfer amino acids into a growing protein. We call that the transfer tRNA. Here is a, you know, a nice summary slide showing the differences between the nucleic acids, where RNA is going to be single-stranded and has, is going to be made of guanine, cytosine, adenine, and uracil, special emphasis on the uracil. DNA is double-stranded and has cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. So in RNA, there's a uracil. In DNA, there's a thymine. Recall base pairing rules that we talked about earlier. Um, thymine pairs with adenine, so A and T pair together within DNA. C and G pair together within DNA. In RNA, C and G pair together, and A and U pair together. So as we look at a nucleotide in, um, to make up a nucleic acid, it has three specific subunits. We have the nitrogenous base, so the adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, thymine, you know, the part of the nitrogenous base that or the part of the nucleotide that changes. We have the ribose sugar, and then we have the phosphate group. ATP is a very important nucleotide in our body. Oh, excuse me. Oh. I really need to drink some coffee, guys, gals. This is too early in the morning for me. So when we look at ATP, it's one adenine, a ribose subunit, and then three phosphates bound together. So this on the screen right now is an ATP molecule. What do we use ATP for? We use ATP to store and transfer energy. This is the energy currency of the cell. When we store this energy from breaking down the food products in our bodies, particularly breaking down the carbohydrates in our bodies, we store that energy temporarily in an ATP molecule. And then the moment we need it, in the drop of a dime, we can use that AT or the drop of a pin, we can use that ATP molecule to power a chemical reaction. We hold energy within the ATP molecule between the second and third phosphate group. So if we look over here, we have one, two, three phosphate groups. This covalent bond right here where my arrow is pointing, oh, press the mouse. That covalent bond right there is the one that holds the energy. That's where most of the energy is going to be in that high energy bond. And when we cleave that bond, that's going to release the energy we've use the energy of the ATP. So, guys, gals, that is it for our crash course on chemistry. We took, you know, about eight credits of college chemistry, and we squeezed eight credits of chemistry into 41 PowerPoint slides. So if you felt like this was a little bit of a roller coaster and that I was talking super quickly, I apologize, because you know what? You're right. This was a roller coaster. You'd probably have whiplash after going through this present, these three chemistry presentations with me. Kudos to you if you stuck it out and made it through all presentations. Uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in class. If you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email or swing by my office hours. Happy studies, guys.